welcome to Untold Hong Kong Stories, multimedia narratives from the margins. This is a podcast series where we hear the stories of people in our community, from Hong Kong's non-Chinese locals to marginalized members of our community. We hope that by sharing their stories, we can think about the way we live ours and create a more inclusive and diverse society. I'm Evelyn Kwok from the Academy of Visual Arts from Hong Kong Baptist University, and our guest for today's podcast is Slavisa Hajanovic, a writer, editor with a background in sociology and publishing from Croatia, who's lived in Hong Kong for seven years. Here she shares her story. I work in communications. I've been in the design industry for over a decade. I'm a writer, I'm an editor, and I have a background in sociology and publishing. I've always had quite a big interest in diaspora, identity, culture, arts, and so I'm kind of like on the margins of all of these topics in different ways, um, and you know, kind of actively participating in different ways. Um, and I guess a lot of those um, interests have sort of been fueled by my family background. Um, and, you know, the family stories and migration that I've experienced as well. So I was born in Melbourne and then I moved to Croatia, uh, where I have part of my family, you know, heritage is from when I was a teenager and then um, went to university there and then went back to Australia to do my master's and um, worked there full time for a while and then had a great opportunity to transition into Shanghai and then Hong Kong. And so here I am now. Wow. What a journey. Yes. I know... Even just like, you know, coming to the studio today, calling you Slavica and yeah. then hearing you introduce your, yourself, which I'm not going to butcher. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always find names is a, it's a, it's an interesting way for somebody to be um, identified and understood yeah. in their place in the world. Yeah. So I wonder, how do you relate to your name? And can you please say it for us? Sure. So because I grew up in Australia um, and, you know, Australians have a really hard time with pronouncing foreign names, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> yes. With your background as well. Um, so I was I was always Slavica and you know, I had no problem with that. But in Croatian and in, you know, any kind of Eastern European Slavic language, they would know to say Slavica because of the C. It's like produced in that way. Um, but actually interesting fact, so on my birth certificate, my surname is written with a J, so it's Hobyanovic. And the J is like a Y sound. But when I enrolled in school, my parents changed my name to Habianovic with a Y. Oh. And then I rebelled at about 11 and I was like, no, I want my real name everywhere. So I like self-initiatively like changed my name on all my, like not documents, but just like in the school registry and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's always been this evolving thing. So I have no problem with people calling me Slavica, but I now sort of tend to introduce myself more as Slavica. And I actually think in Hong Kong people can say it. So they do. But yeah. <laughs> There's variations of it. Slavica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's okay. You can call me Slavica. It's fine. Is there, <laughs> is there a special meaning behind the name? What does it mean? So Slavica means, uh, in English, it would mean Gloria. Mm. Um, but then it comes from like the verb Slaviti, which means to celebrate or to glorify. Wow, to celebrate yeah. or to glorify. Yeah. That, from what I know of you, that <laughs> is 100% accurate and slavia means like party or celebration and that's very accurate wow. you are a party 100 percent. I, yeah. I if i had to choose any word in the dictionary <laughs> in any language <laughs> so it's accurate yeah wow. awesome so how do you end up being in hong kong is it just because of work or is there is there any kind of pull to be like actually i want a different experience in life for sure i think um, you know, I think there are people that are kind of have that sort of adventurism in them or some sort of curiosity, especially about places. Um, and I mean, you know, people can travel and experience that, but I think for me, um, I've always been very curious about the realities in different places. Um, and, you know, as much as I've been afforded the opportunity or been able to create the opportunity, I've kind of strive for that. And, um, I think Hong Kong especially has just been a really, really amazing and kind place to me. Mm. Um, and it's it's been a place where I've been able to find, I'd say, a great community um, and to some degrees a sense of belonging, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But, um, yeah, I think Australia was interesting. Like, I really felt like I, uh, I really wanted to go back after my uh, university finished in Croatia and I was working there for a while. 
And I wanted to sort of see what it was like living there as an adult independently. And that was a great experience. But then at some point I almost felt like I outgrew it a little bit, mm. which maybe sounds a little bit, I don't know, <laughs> wrong to say. But it kind of felt like, you know, Australia is an amazing place, but it's very inward looking. Mm. And I've always kind of been very hungry for, you know, sort of understanding the world from different perspectives and just, you know, kind of in its entirety as much as I possibly can, which obviously is very difficult. But, yeah, I think just um, – and I fell in love with Shanghai. You know, the first time I went there, I was like, this is – so exciting it's just such an you know incredible place and um you know witnessing a huge country like china it's just it's amazing so yeah Mm. thinking about the experience of of wow you know when you step into a country Mm. you don't necessarily speak the language Mm. and you know the culture is not quite clear to you you know the kind of cultural norms you know that kind of thing coming to hong kong i mean obviously you would identify in a way as as a westernized expat because you know english is you know a mother tongue or a mother tongue enough to you was there a moment where you feel like when you're in hong kong that you're a minority in any sense or or at least um not just not just a minority but maybe um even as a as a person who's on the margins in some way Mm. how do you feel about that and how was that like for you okay so I think we'll definitely separate the minority and the marginalised questions because I think they're two different things. So, um, I mean, yes, like ethnically I'm a minority here. I'm not part of the majority ethnic and, you know, other group here, um, language group. So I think that I fall into that kind of um, category by any sort of standards. Um, <clears throat> I kind of forget that sometimes. You know, I, I tend to think that I blend in, <laughs> but I don't. I love the confidence. I love it. I just kind of think that, you know, but yeah, I, I obviously don't blend in because I don't look like the majority of people here, but that's fine. I mean, I don't feel like that's such an issue, but it's just like, you know, you kind of think that you're inconspicuous walking down the street, but actually you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm definitely, I would say I'm a minority, but, um, you know, it is interesting because yes, uh, I have an Australian accent and, you know, I'd say definitely part of my identity is tied to Australia, but then it's also Eastern European and actually that kind of garners more interest in, from people. They're always kind of interested more about the Croatian story and, you know, the aspect of me rather than the Australian, which is kind of interesting. And I think that's a little bit of curiosity. It's also a little bit tied to the rise of Croatia as this, like, tourist destination, in, you know, these last years. And then obviously I think, you know, the marginalisation or marginalised question is, yeah, that's an interesting one. I do not think that by any sort of... Um, regular kind of standards I would consider myself marginalized and I don't think that you know I should because that would kind of be quite demeaning to that term um you know I think about myself as having you know a visa here I've got a certain status that's attached to the visa so I've got employment I'm a professional I've got money I've got a home you know I have some sort of agency over my own um uh life here so I don't think that I'm marginalized but I also think that it's kind of a scale Mm. Um, you know, there are people that are very disenfranchised or have got absolutely no legal status in limbo, like refugees, for instance. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a whole, like, you know, scale of that. Um, the thing that I would, though, I was thinking about this a little bit, you know, it's kind of like not exactly marginalised, but I would say personally me, and we might get into this, you know, for various reasons of why I feel this way, but I would say I feel vulnerable. Mm. And I think there's a bit of a vulnerability attached to people that are maybe on visas Mm. And then particularly for my situation and circumstance. But yeah. You use the word kind to say that, you know, Hong Kong feels kind to you. Mm. What can you elaborate on that? What was that like for you? Or what is that like for you? I think it's a very gentle I and mean, again, this is like very much based on my own experiences, you know, and everyone's experience is different, but I can really speak for mine. So I'll I'll talk from that perspective, of course. Um I think it's a very gentle city. I think it's very welcoming. Um, I think that even though it's quite conservative in some ways, I still think that it's quite tolerant Mm. and it allows people to kind of be who they are, you know, um, in many ways. And I think it's just, even though when I first got here, I remember just, you know, the, the density in that, like, I love the density, but it was, it's overwhelming, especially when you come from, you know, Melbourne, Mm. where I came from, like previously to my, um, to my move here. And so you know, what, until I figured out kind of like how the city breathes, where you can kind of go and find a little bit of space and some quiet, it, you know, that was, it was quite overwhelming. But then the flip side of that is actually there's quite some calm and there's a gentleness and a, 
a very, um, I don't know, a slower pace of life in some ways. And I think it's just, it's kind of quite open and it's quite a curious city in many ways. And I do think actually a lot of that does have to do with the history of Hong Kong where it's had so many waves of migration in, Mm. you know, everyone's kind of like trying to do something here. So yeah. And I mean, of course that can be quite cutthroat and competitive, but I also think that it can be quite kind and that people are very open and curious to different Mm. um, things. And because it is also a little bit transient, you know, maybe there's a kindness for looking out for people in some communities. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, from what you're saying, I'm getting a picture of um, like a sense of acceptance as well, yeah. that there are people from different backgrounds, from different um, walks of life that might be in Hong Kong who, yeah, should be welcomed and who should feel welcomed, you know, when they're in a space like this, even yeah. though, like you said, it's very dense and sometimes it seems very fast paced, but there's also, there's a sense of comfort, there's a sense of, mm. you know, safety. Mm, as well for sure um, but I also think you know of course my experience is, is very is specific to you know having come on a professional visa having you know again money and some sort of agency to to create my own life here whereas you know there are definitely very marginalized communities mm, which course. we know of yeah yeah that yeah. experience is very different very different yeah. yeah I want to go back to your point about vulnerability mm. can you talk a little bit about about, about that why I feel vulnerable and how yeah. I feel vulnerable okay I think anybody that is on some sort of, in some sort of visa situation where your life is tied to somebody else's, you know, granting you either Mm. a status or, you know, employment or something like that automatically makes you a little bit vulnerable. And so obviously all countries have this in some form, but I think, you know, whenever you migrate, you kind of put your hands a little bit in the fate of, or, you know, you, you give that power over a little bit to a government or an employer or, you know, whoever it is. And so with that, it just kind of, it makes it feel like, you know, your life could turn in a couple of days. Mm. And I think particularly, you know, I'm almost at seven years in Hong Kong, so almost getting permanent residency. But seven years is a long time. Mm. It's almost a decade. And so in that sense, you know, it kind of feels like there's this constant impermeance where things could change quite quickly. And it's an interesting space to be in. And I think, you know, for the first couple of years for me in Hong Kong, it was like, okay, you know, I was traveling a lot. It wasn't such an issue. And I was sort of, you know, it's all fresh and you kind of don't really know what your future's going to hold. And then, you know, I didn't maybe have as many connections to the city, but then having really been here rooted during both COVID and, you know, it was really lovely to kind of really sort of start really building a home for myself. The thought that, you know, that could change quite quickly overnight. And that has happened with so many people, you know, not just here, obviously there's been a lot of, turbulence during these years all around the world where people have had decisions made for them that they maybe wouldn't have made for themselves it's quite you know it does leave you in a quite a vulnerable way and then you know a lot of people like well you know whatever you can go back to Australia or go back to Croatia but going somewhere after 10 years it's another migration you know so that does kind of make you a bit vulnerable and for me personally because I don't have immediate family I don't have family in countries where I have citizenship or the right of a bow, that's also a really interesting dynamic. You know, that makes me feel very vulnerable in many ways as well. Yeah. How does that vulnerability translate? Because this sense of vulnerability sounds very macro, you know, that mm. your life could be flipped. Yeah. You know, you could have to just shift, go, bang, right? How does this vulnerability translate into everyday life in, you know, the minutiae of everyday life? Mm, interesting. <sighs> Um, I haven't thought about that. I think, I mean, I do think actually it's kind of an interesting um, position to be in. I don't actually know a lot of people in my position. There's some people that have maybe got some similarities and I kind of observe them and sort of like look for what they do and how they do it as well and, you know, how it kind of manifests in those li- in their lives. Um, I mean, I think it kind of means that you're sort of both trying to create a life that's maybe not based on standard templates that society is sort of built around, you know, this idea of like having the right to live and work in a place where you've got like, you know, some sort of citizenship or you can buy property there or, you know, whatever, like um, it kind of just means that you're having to sort of build a life that's maybe a little bit more, it's a bit more creative in some ways. I think it's a bit of a negotiation in terms of like, you know, 
how you feel tied to a place mm. as well. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of curious, you know, when I get permanent residency soon, like how that's going to make me feel, but it already gives me a sense of relief knowing that that's coming. I'm hoping that the government doesn't change anything too quickly in the next couple of years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's kind of like, but I also think, I also think there's an interesting, um, kind of juxtaposition, say for instance, because we're both, you and I have both got, you know, some of our experience lived in Australia. Australia is a country that's had a very, very, very long stable period and people just aren't used to turmoil and upheaval and changes and things. Whereas where I come from, it's like constant change. And so people just, yeah, like Eastern Europe, Croatia, all that area is just like constant change. So people are just used to dealing with like not being able to plan ahead, Mm. you know? And so in some ways I'm kind of like, wow, I've kind of come full circle, (laughs) you know? That sense of, um, almost being unbound right yeah. because you know when we use words to describe stability we also think grounded mm. or there's some sort of binding to something and it's not a negative or a positive you know it's just how it is and like you're saying you know maybe then in australia or where you're used to that there's less change you know it's it's much easier to be you know, yes, achievements look like buying property, staying yes. put, having a house, having children, having all these sort of quite standard goals, right? In and life, milestones. In milestones, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But now you're saying, you know, you brought up the word creativity, mm. you know, maybe because you're, you're more or less unbound mm. in Hong Kong. It's the thing that is stable. Yes, it's your job, you know, mm. but things could flip, you know, mm. then you could be sent somewhere else, you know, because of visa reasons. Mm. But that kind of unboundness allows creativity, allows for freedom. Mm. And, you know, I I can sense that from you. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that sense of unboundness is also exciting, that there's room for creativity. Yeah, I think so. I think it kind of means that you don't, yeah, you don't look at the templates that are established. You kind of look outside of those and um, you, yeah, I mean, you sort of... uh, I do have a sense of like maybe urgency in some ways like you know what's today doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be tomorrow or next week so you kind of have to act a little bit now which maybe isn't great because it's a little bit of like not FOMO but it's just a bit of you know it's a little bit of anxiety (laughs) but then I also think you know people like me are maybe like quite well geared to change and just upheaval you know Mm. and kind of just understanding that what is today won't necessarily be tomorrow and I think in a world which is rapidly changing all the time more and more I think you know there's there's a certain advantage in that well I mean it also helps that you know your creativity has also allowed you to produce something that is quite monumental and substantial and you know for listeners who cannot see what's in front of us um I have a beautiful book here and I'm holding it for the camera um yeah Croatian stories and I was saying I was saying to you earlier today um outside of the recording that I was so moved by reading your introduction Mm. and that just gave me that really pulled me into your world about what is home what is culture you know your connection to a culture what is what's roots what's family what's dedication um what's love Mm. and creativity And, you know, I understand that right now, speaking about being in a world where there's so much uncertainty, you know, you could plan for something and things would just be flipped anyway. But now, you know, this, this beautiful collection is forever out there in the world. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about this? Sure. Um, Yeah, so Creation Stories is a book that I recently published, and it's a collection of columns that I wrote um, over a 10-year period for the Croatian Herald in Australia. Shout out to the Croatian Herald, (laughs) the original community newspaper. It's actually the longest uh, standing publication in the Croatian diaspora. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, it's it's claim to fame. Um, Yeah, so I had a column for 10 years and it was like this very formative decade of my life where I had both moved from, as I said, like back to Australia and then uh, in that period, also Shanghai and then Hong Kong and ended the columns when I was, when I moved to Hong Kong. And it was, you know, a period in which my parents both passed away. And then, you know, there was a lot of like changing Croatia where we joined the EU. There was the whole migrant 
crisis, which is still ongoing um, through Europe. So yeah, a lot of a lot of changes in that decade. But then also for me, like you know, I kind of stepped from like student to kind of adult, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a really big body of work. And I kind of just at the end of it, I wanted to really just read through them. And I was like, oh, maybe I could do a book. Maybe I'll just put it into like a PDF and share it with my friends. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I was like, maybe I should actually get this a little bit more designed up. And then I ended up working with a really uh, great emerging designer from Croatia called Emilda Ramovic, who produced this beautiful book. Yeah, it's kind of taken on its own little life. It's interesting, like, you know, when you talk about, yeah, putting that, I guess, there's questions about, instability or maybe just like the connection to home or what is home you know this is sort of like an exploration so it's like kind of I guess outside of the templates of what you would normally do it's like this is a bit more of a a way of me even questioning I mean there's a lot of like questions in there there's some answers but I think there's probably more questions than anything else Mm. I mean as an academic you know I love reading a book that gives questions yeah. and answers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> love to you know really you know give us a space to really think for ourselves um you know and I think again you know it's this idea of home mm. and migration you've been through so many spaces at different times of your life and now you're here and you've in a sense you know not not fossilized in this way this is very old but mm. you've put this into concrete now mm. that writing is a clear expression of your creativity and love and your dedication to home mm. you know to me you know when i'm seeing this i just feel this strong sense of home and home isn't necessarily yeah like home's not necessarily about a place mm. home is where love is home is where you feel at ease and seen and this you know I feel like there's a lot of you that I can see Mm. as it's it's a celebration interesting and so do you see like the sense of home coming through as a as a more abstract concept in this or well I guess the writing or home is not so much a physical place Mm. right because you know you feel at home in Hong Kong I would assume right because you've been here for nearly seven years, yeah. you know, you're very comfortable, you have friends. Yeah. and I put an asterisk on that though, right? Because this this has been the struggle where, like, I have created what I would say is a home, mm. but then you're like, at any point that could flip. Mm-hmm. And so you're kind of like, oh, do I invest more? You know, it's just this kind of slight sense of unease, but then it's kind of going back to what I talked about, like, it is today, who knows what it is tomorrow, you know, I'll probably adapt. But that is a difficult space to live in, but it's also an exciting space. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I mean, it's not going to flip this, for example, this is there forever now. It's in print, it's in the world, (laughs) it's shared, you know, it's a shared expression Mm. of your humanity, of your commitment Mm. to migration, home, family, love, connection. And there's a sense here that I've, I can feel your expressions in the last 10 years because mm. these are the columns that you've written, right, over a 10-year period. Mm. How does it feel to use, to be able to have that so clearly, you know, for you that writing is something that you can channel your creativity no matter where mm. you are, whether you're in Hong Kong, Shanghai, yeah. Croatia, Australia? Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a really, that's a really lovely reflection because um, actually that's another thing sort of that we might talk about later. But, yeah, it's been really lovely to, I, you know, I had zero anticipation around the book I was like it'll you know go to some like Croatians and diaspora it'll go to a few of my friends it'll be it'll be just like a nice little thing to have but actually the reception has been a lot bigger from people that are not Croatians than I expected at all and so that's been amazing because I do think actually anyone that's kind of got some sort of migration experience kind of connects with the stories a lot more than I thought they would so that's lovely so thank you for that um Yeah, no, having, I think, writing not just as an outlet, but kind of as a medium to connect with people, that's been amazing. And, you know, as I said, I think it's kind of connected with people already in ways that I haven't expected. And people have found, you know, laughter and, you know, sadness and connection in different sentences as well. It's interesting always what kind of strikes people. It's always interesting to hear what's particularly resonating with them. Um, But, yeah, I really, what I did kind of have is like a very, like, high level dream for the book was that it would spark some sort of conversations between, you know, not just the Croatians in the diaspora, but maybe Croatians in Croatia and kind of a little bit more of a dialogue because 
I think, especially with the Croatian diaspora, you know, we're so, we're a tiny country. Our diaspora is just as big as the amount of people in the country, but we're still, you know, it's a very tiny number. Um, and then again, the voices that are sort of heard from the diaspora, they're very small, they're very particular. It's like quite a fossilized, you know, diaspora. So this is kind of like hopefully the start of maybe a little bit more dialogue and different voices being heard. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really lovely. But I also think it's kind of, you know, I went through a lot of, um, I think actually the introduction was like the really hard bit for me to write in some ways, but it was also a little bit cathartic, but it also did. I mean, it still makes me cry a little bit when I read it. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it's kind of like there's this power in maybe feeling a little bit vulnerable and a little bit feeling lost and kind of not knowing these answers, you know. Um, it's exciting, but it's also hard on a daily basis, yeah. I mean, it's it's more powerful to be doing something that scares you, mm. right? Because there is an uncertainty and the fear, mm. even though you know the fear is there, but it's not stopping you. It's, mm. It propelled you forward, if anything, yeah. to, to be even louder, you know, in some sense, to be like, okay, I have these ideas, I have these stories, I'm going to put them together and I'm going to print it. doesn't matter who's going to read it. Maybe yeah. it will generate dialogue. Maybe it will just be with my friends. Let's see, yeah. right? And and now the ongoing, it's going to ripple through. Yeah, you know, it's something that will continue to be not just an internal dialogue. Yes, you know, it will always be an expanding dialogue. Yeah. Which and there's a lovely thing to think about books where they actually have quite a long life. You know, even in like five years, people can still read it and it'll still be relevant in some ways. Like, oh yeah, there's a timestamp, but it's still like you know the topics are kind of eternal. So yeah, it's time stamped, But you know, yeah. hey, as again as academics, we still reference books from yes, 60, exactly. 60, 100 years, two hundred, and years you can read it in the context of that time. Like you sort of exactly. look at when it was published and sort of know. So even yeah, it was interesting. Like going back over columns that I'd written ten years ago. You know, it was like wow, some stuff like really surprised me in a good way some stuff was like wow <laughs> I can't believe I wrote that and put it out like de- so it's just a best of like just to clarify it's not all my columns it's only about 17 years book it's just the ones that I loved <laughs> <laughs> there were some that should never see the light of day again oh gosh I'm sure, I'm sure somebody would like to see them <laughs> yeah um, I have to ask have you connected with any Croatians in Hong Kong I have actually so we have um there's like a couple there's probably about maybe 10 or 15 and I mean this you know changes it's fluctuating um but we actually recently had a dinner with the Croatian ambassador to China he came down to Hong Kong for the first time obviously since like COVID um and he gathered all 20 of us that he knew and uh, we had dinner and it was it was really fun I thought it was going to be a little bit like stifled I was probably the youngest person in the room to be honest um but it was really fun. And obviously everyone's from different walks of life. So there's some people that are like me that were born in the diaspora. And there are people that are, from, you know, from Croatia, like proper and moved mm. here from there. So there's few of those. But yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, we're so tiny, you know, it's just like, it's so rare to meet somebody that speaks your language. So, and this is always an interesting juxtaposition because I have a lot of friends from India and I have a lot of friends also from China. And I'm just like, wow, what does it feel like to be from like, the two biggest countries in the world and wherever you go there's like <laughs> shops that sell your food there's like people that speak your language this is so it's so wild to me like i can't even imagine it you know <laughs> wow how does it feel to be acknowledged and recognized by someone or some like an entity that's so official like a governmental kind of um, i've always had a lot to do with government entities actually mm. <laughs> i think in croatia like you're always about one degree of separation from anything like that so <laughs> It doesn't feel like anything particularly, um, I guess, special. It's just a kind of, you know, we kind of have to work together otherwise. Yeah, but especially like, you know, in Australia, I was um, obviously involved with the paper and then I did film festivals. Um, I did some other cultural work as well. So I was always kind of connected in some ways to government um, bodies and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how does it feel to be, to have that experience and be in Hong Kong? Do you feel a sense that you want to connect with Mm. the cultural sector in Hong Kong as well, even more so because of that, you know, yeah. that history and background that you've You mean the Hong Kong cultural sector? Yeah. For sure. I mean, I think I'm on the margins of it. I think I've got, like, you know, little, like, feet in and little, like, you know, tentacles kind of poking in a little bit. But I think what is actually, I was thinking about this the other day, I think the tricky thing is that, or sad thing also is a little bit, that I realised that it is very difficult for someone like me that doesn't have, you know, Hong Kong 
background or Chinese ethnic background to kind of actually work in some sort of official, um, you know, institution or something. Um, it's probably quite difficult for, I, they, they do bring in people, but they're very specialised, you know. Mm. It would be really lovely. I think this is kind of the thing I've been thinking about, you know, what could give me a bigger sense of belonging here is to be a little bit more involved with some of those more official, you know, entities and things. Because mm. private sector is one, but then institutions and things like universities are amazing, mm. and, you know, yeah. And Hong Kong has a lot of that, but I think it is a little bit harder. The barrier for entry is a little bit harder for, for non-locals. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is... Definitely, yeah, mm. I can see that. Um, do you feel fully expressed in Hong Kong? That's an interesting question. I feel, I feel, as I said, I think because it's such a welcoming place, um, and I know other people probably have different experiences and opinions about it, but from my perspective, I think that it's, like, very open to new ideas and mm. to just people trying things. And I think actually that's quite a generalisation we can make about Asia in general, and I think particularly you know, this part of the world is just, like, so, like, try it. <laughs> because you can make things happen very quickly. And so I think this is culture of, like, being able to try things. And I think, you know, on the one hand, the barrier for entry is a bit, is quite low, which then, you know, that does mean maybe that the quality sometimes isn't as high, but that it does mean that you can try things and you can learn and you can just make things happen really quickly. Whereas I feel like, okay, in Croatia, for instance, there's a lot of judgment. <laughs> So it's very hard to try new things because there's always someone that wants to shoot you down even before you even start, you know. I feel like in Australia, the barrier for entry is quite high and I think that then flip side is that it's very, like, high quality but it does mean that it's really hard, it's much harder to try things. So I feel like in Hong Kong, I had the ability to just, like, sort of try things a little bit or be, you know, a little bit more, maybe more, take some more risks than I would have in other places. Yeah, I can definitely imagine, you know, that, as someone coming into Hong Kong who can see its potential that it's, yeah, just give it a go. Mm. You know, the sense of welcomeness that you feel, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's give it a go, mm. you know, because you're not getting, you're not going to get shot down. Yeah. Not as easily in other places or like you said, from if it was in Croatia, yeah. for example. And I do think that is also a little bit of like that, the speed of the city is just like things happen so fast and change so fast. So it's kind of like, because of that, you know, you do something probably people will forget within two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much going on. What? There is. So, you know, that is kind of, but I, I do think it's a great place to, to um, explore, you know, your passions, yourself, your like, you know, ideas and things. There's, I think, a lot of room for that here. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, back to that question of expression. Um, I think that it, I would love to have a little bit maybe more a little bit maybe more, like, space for some create. Like, I actually think physical space is really difficult here, which so we all know it is because of, um, yeah, just the complexities of density plus brand and all that. But, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of room that I would still like to explore in terms of creativity and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself living in Hong Kong in the near future? Yes, I definitely have no plans to leave at this stage. Um, I don't feel like that this chapter of my life is over. I feel like actually it's almost a new chapter but in the same place you know mm. like getting permanent residency soon plus this new era after COVID is kind of like quite exciting I think it's going to be really exciting to see what happens in Hong Kong now um you know especially given the past years of everything that happened 2019 onwards um what do you yeah. think your life here in the near future is going to look like I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's actually a really lovely time where um, I feel like maybe that trauma of, like, COVID is sort of we're starting to get over it collectively a little bit, mm. you know, and I think the last weeks of, like, all the activities in the city have sort of shown that. Um, but I still I feel like actually I've really had a really amazing period of being able to um, understand, you know, and get to know the local culture a bit more, um, build community, kind of put roots down a bit more. And so it's kind of like the best of both worlds where, we're going to be more outward looking because we can now, but then I've also got more of a sense of place. Mm. So yeah, I think it's going to hopefully be exciting. I really get the sense of your embodiment mm. of, of excitement in, in a place like yeah. in this place in yeah. particular right now, which is, which is infectious. I think, you know, cause That's a lot great. of people yeah. have said, Oh my gosh, because of, 
X, Y, Z reasons. Mm. Oh, I've got to go somewhere else now because it's not as exciting as it used to be. Mm. But I think every place in the world had its had its moment of down, right, in the last yeah. three years. Um, and they're very personal things. You know, as I said, like, my personal situation is very specific in some ways. And so, you know, I can only kind of work with what I've got. Mm. Um, but I think what I've got is pretty great. So I'm very grateful for it. I, I would actually like to talk a little bit about, like, last summer when I went back to Croatia for the first time. And I was there for three months. And everyone's like, oh, my God, three months of Croatia. Sounds amazing. But it was actually probably one of the hardest periods of my life. And that was partly... Um, because I was in Croatia for the first time for a long period of time without my parents, you know, they both passed away. And so I was in, you know, what is my city at a place where I, you know, both have a name that, you know, people can pronounce and don't like wonder. I have citizenship there. I have like a home. And yet I sort of felt incredibly disoriented. Mm. Um, and I realized it's because, you know, I am still grieving. But I'm also kind of grieving a little bit for my past life in a way. And I always knew that when my parents passed away, I'd have to sort of renegotiate my um, my relationship with the place. You know, I'd have to sort of maybe root it more in place than people. And, of course, I've got friends and I've got extended family. But I think also what happened is because of COVID, they all turned a lot more inward too. Mm. So people a lot more sort of in their own little bubble of family and, you know. And so I kind of had to, like, think about, what does this place mean? You know, am I going to be able to rebuild a relationship with it? And it was both intense and beautiful, mm. but also incredibly difficult. So like I journaled every day. I'm really glad I did that because it's very raw, like emotion and just, you know, my observations and, and things that, um, I don't really have an answer. And it was quite surprising to me. I didn't think it would actually be like that. And it was interesting because I just finished the book. And so I was like, I have this thing that I'm now going to promote. <laughs> about Croatian identity and I'm like questioning everything about my identity you know wow that sounds like kind of the perfect way to finish writing a book (laughs) you know it's like you you've created this solidified you know sort of ideas and expression and then you literally go back to where it all kind of originated. Yeah, and then I was like, I want to change my name. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm feeling disorientated and, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, that sounds like a really moving experience for you as well as kind of a, almost like a, like a love letter, like a bittersweet love letter to that part of your, that part of your life. It that was, but I didn't life. really think it was going to, I kind of anticipated it would sort of just be a continuation of like pre-COVID, you know, 2019 summer, you know, I thought it was just going to be a continuation and actually it was, it felt like a really new chapter and I wasn't prepared for that, you know? Um, and so I think I was just like in a lot of shock, but as you say, it was a little bit of a bittersweet moment. And so I don't really have the answers. I've been grappling with that. It was, <laughs> I mean, I think often I feel like these are more stories that we, we have right rather mm. than needing to find an answer to mm. anything because there is no answer the answer is that it is right yeah. you know croatia is your home hong kong is also your home yeah. australia is also your home you know in different ways in exactly different things. and so i think i think it's a lot more interesting but i think it's also like it's very complex and i think maybe some people don't really have the sensitivity around that and so i don't share that with a lot of people as well because i think you know it doesn't really fit their templates of like the answers that you're supposed to give them so yeah but I'm very glad that you know I can have a conversation with someone that's very empathetic and gets it too on so many different levels yeah yeah there's one line here from your book that I'm just going to read because it really it it, it sinks up everything mm-hmm. that you've sort of been saying is that I hope this book serves as another line in the overall narrative and as a vehicle to bring people together I see it as a small contribution towards seeing and hearing each other in the diaspora and also as a dialogue between the diaspora and Croatia and the wider world. Mm. I mean, that is your love letter to not just Croatia, but to the world, to your family. It's, it is exactly as you're saying, there's no need for an answer Mm. because it's, it just is. Mm. And on that lovely note, <laughs> I want to ask you three words to describe your state of being in Hong Kong right now. Um, right now. Excited for the future. 
excited for future. It's <laughs> grammatically incorrect, but <laughs> future excited me. <laughs> wow, amazing! Future excited me. <laughs> And on that note, we will wrap it up. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much.